This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Anticipation, planning and execution. So these are the three foundation pillars which ensure great outcomes for our patient even in a complex case. Now this is one such case which exemplifies that. This case is going to be very long, but if you hang on until the end, I'm sure you're going to learn quite a lot of uh, pearls. So please do stick around until the end. Here is an 80 year old lady who presents with this white mature cataract. Preliminary examination reveals that she also has pseudo exfoliation. The pupillary dilatation is not great. The antechamber depth is shallow and you can see the lens is intumescent and we can clearly see uh, the pockets of fluid and underneath it we have the cortex and incidentally also find an anatomy which is done which the patient is not aware of. The patient vehemently denies of having undergone any anatomy. Probably she doesn't remember. There's no records to verify. See the pressures are around 24 and 26 and it, I don't know the status of the optic nerve head. So uh, this is the situation and we have to remove the lens. These are the anti-segment OCT pictures. We can clearly see that the this is a variant of intumescent lens which doesn't look to be very threatening uh, for inducing an Argentinian flag sign simply because uh, this large pool of fluid liquefied cortex. The moment we touch the capsule it's going to decompress on its own and it's uh, really not going to be much of an issue as far as Rexis is concerned. The antechamber depth by our optical biometer suggests just 2 mm depth and we have got a very bulky lens to deal with. So if you go back and look at the anti-segment image, it looks like the entire lens iris diaphragm is pushed forward and this is an indirect clue that this is a case where you know you're going to expect diffuse zonulopathy. So apart from pseudo exfoliation, elderly age also is a contributing factor in these patients and so we've got multiple challenges to deal with. So I would just pause the video and request all the younger surgeons to take a pen and a paper and write down what difficulties we expect in the surgeries and what are your plan A, plan B and plan C to deal with these complexities. At the same time, I've asked my fellow to write down how she's going to plan the surgery here. And hopefully I've done this and this is what my fellow has written. So some of the things are right here like you know see the basic the main issues are we need to deal with the pupil we need to deal with the capsule because of the intumescent lens nature and thirdly we need to deal with the zonular health so we don't know what is the zonular health as of now it is my assumption looking at the way the dynamics of the antechamber are and uh, with the coexisting pseudo exfoliation i am expecting a lax zonule so let us encounter them each step by step. So to, for pupil, it's about say five and a half millimeter. I'm worried about intraoperative meiosis. So if I go in and in the middle of the surgery, if I have a meiosis, it would complicate the things. So I would want a device which ensures better pupillary dilatation and that would help me to manage other pathologies with ease like probably a loose bag. So my choices here would be a Gupta ring, a BX ring or an iris hooks. So the reason why I would avoid an iris hook is simply because you know I need to make those four additional ports. I would prefer to use a pupil based device. Now between a Gupta ring and BX ring what would I use? So if I would want to have a very wide dilatation definitely I would prefer a Gupta ring. But in this case because the space between the iris and the anti-capsule is very less while inserting the Gupta ring there is a a remote possibility that you know during manipulation of the flanges into the pupillary margin I might tear the anti-capsule just because it is a little bit more rigid as well as bulky so in this case I consciously chose a PX device uh, but the disadvantage of the PX device is uh, the pupillary expansion is going to be limited but I thought this 5.5 millimeter, if it can be sustained until the adult surgery it should be fine so with that I would just went ahead and I put a tick mark on BX ring. Now coming to the capsule rexus, because this is a variant of intermittent lens where the intermittent component is not because of the swollen cortical fiber themselves but rather than that we have islands of fluid collection in between these swollen fibers and these variants of intermittent lenses are not so threatening as far as the rexus is concerned because 
the intracapsular pressure is immediately decompressed as soon as we puncture it. There is no need to go and aspirate it the moment we puncture. It is all let out and the capsular pressure is drops down. So I don't expect uh, the capsule rexus to be an issue, but I want to be very mindful in sizing the rexus appropriately, simply because I plan to use the IOL trap technique in this case, uh, that is put the haptics of a multi-piece lens in the sulcus and push the optic back to achieve an optic capture. This would ensure better long-term stability in these loose bags. So that's my idea. So sizing and centration of the rexus is critical. Then moving on to deal with the zonular weakness. So in this option, again, we have an option of directly using a capsular hook in the event of a very weak bag or I could just go ahead and try putting a CTR first if it works fine, otherwise no. Either way, I've kept both CTR and the capsule hooks ready. The reason why I'm choosing CTR first to be inserted and not the hooks first is because I have to make those extra four ports. And it takes a little bit of time and effort. If I can get through just with the CTR, it would be great. And many times it does happen that you can just get away by just putting a CTR. But the actual situation will be knowing only once we touch the capsule and see things down there. So either way, we need to be prepared for both of things. Uh, lastly, number fourth, I should also be mindful that because of the existing zonular weakness, there is always a possibility of a fluid misdirection happening because uh, fluids can go through the porous zonular barrier into the burger space and then push the posterior capsule anteriorly and there is always a remote risk of rupturing the posterior capsule. So these are all the things uh, which are going into my head and I made a list of it. So basically we have got plan A, plan B, plan C and plan D ready now. So the bigger picture is can we save the bag and put the posterior chamber lens in this patient? Well, I think we can because we have planned it so meticulously. Let us see how things start out. The incisions are done, the capsule is stained and uh, the ovid is pushed into the bag. The main incision is created. So far so good. Uh, the first thing I need to do is to introduce the pupil expansion device and in this case I'm using the P-hex ring. And the first glance it looks like the pupil is all right. We can go ahead and do the surgery without using any device itself. But in the case of an intraoperative complexity, like, you know, you realize that the zonules are not great and that time we may struggle. So best thing is to use uh, any device which is going to at least maintain the mitriasis until the end of the surgery. So I would think that PX device is more like a retainer of the pupillary size rather than expander. And that's fine for me at the, in this case. And this is the standard protocol which I follow to place the BHEX ring. The fixation device which is I'm using is the Banaji's eye lock. I got it from Epsilon. Okay, now this is the most uh, crucial moment of the surgery. This is the step which is going to tell me uh, the health of the zonules. The moment I touch the capsule with the forceps and trying to perforate, we can see these radial folds appearing and it's almost impossible for me to puncture the capsule with the forceps. Simply because there's no counter traction by the zonules which would help me to perforate it. So I need to have a much more sharper instrument than this tip of the forceps. So I go back with my 26G bent needle and with that I could perforate the capsule, raise the flap. And then again, I'm going to resort back to the forceps because in eyes with loose zonules, I would rather prefer to have a forceps to make the rexus simply because it gives better traction. It's easier to tear the capsule as well as to control it. So again, I need to remind myself that I don't want to go bigger than 5 or 5.5 millimeter. The BX device is giving me an expansion about 5.5 millimeter. So I'm somewhere around about that. It's about 5 millimeter. So it gives a sort of a template for me to size my rexus. Hydrodissection is probably the most important step when dealing with these eyes with loose bags. I would not proceed to nucleus management unless and until I'm very much certain that the corticocapsular adhesions are well and truly broken. Uh, before that, I'm just depulking the superficial epinucleus with the phaco tip itself so that I can see well and also know where my cannula is going. Usually for mature cataracts, I would not do a hydrodissection, but this is a special case. We've got diffuse on lopathy, the bag is very loose. And in these situations, I felt it is mandatory that uh, I would go ahead and try hydrodissection. The moment I try to press down the nucleus and decompress and just move the nucleus away, I can see that the entire bag is moving along with it. 
So now before doing anything else, I would first want to go ahead and insert the CTR now. Now before trying to introduce the CTR, uh, one trick I would like to share here is that we need to create some space under the anter capsule. So I go ahead with my bimanual IND and uh, try to aspirate some of the fluffy cortex, loose cortex, which is under the anter capsule, so that this would help us to create some space. Now, before putting the CTR, I realized that the capsular staining is not so great, especially in this quadrant. So I would want to go ahead and uh, stain the capsule once again. I know that it's already come in contact with OVD, the staining might not be great, but still it is worth a try. So I go in and redo the staining. It is slightly better. And now is the time to introduce CTR. Again, another tip here is to create some space using cohesive OVD. So I'm using sodium hyaluronate here just to lift up the anti-capsule and this creates some space uh, for me to thread in the CTR. So at this stage, I realize the pupillary dilatation is not so great uh, because the capsule margin is just hidden uh, near the pupillary margin. And nevertheless, I could still find in the space and then gently thread in the CTR. As the CTR is being threaded in, it always like to keep an eye on the margin and to ensure that whether the CTR is tenting up the excess margin or not. This convinces me that the CTR is truly inside the bag and under the anter capsule rather than being over it. The second hand comes into play, compresses the ring and finally the trailing notch of the CTR is negotiated into the capsule bag. Time to redo the hydrodissection. At this time, I hoping and praying that, you know, the CTR would have done the job for me. It would have stabilized the bag enough. I want to go ahead and read the hydrodissection. And if the nucleus is free and mobile now, I would continue the FACO. But lo behold, even after putting the CTR, I am unable to, you know, separate the corticocapsular adhesions. And the moment I try to nudge the nucleus, the capsule bag also moves. So now we have our plan C or plan D come into action. This case deserves a capsular hook. So I need to use these capsule hooks. So there is a very famous quote by Dr. Abhay Vasauda. So he very famously said once that, you know, in when things are going tough, you should not look at the clock, but you should look at the calendar. So spending extra time on a patient during surgery should never be a consideration for the surgeon. Whatever time the situation at hand demands, think it should be given without a second thought. So it's more of a mind game. You should block out everything. Don't worry about the previous case, the next case, which is going to come. I still have a long case to do. I need to do something in the OPD. Just block everything and focus on this case. So these are the capsule looks which, which I'm using. These are made by uh, Madhu Instruments, no financial interest. Of course, the MST ones are much more uh, elegant, delicate and easy to use. It's just that myself or my patients can afford them. That's the reason why we're using these Gupta devices and they work fine for us. See, the location of these four hooks are strategic. I also have to have one port for my side port. So my side port incision happens to be just beside the capsule hook. So once the hooks are placed, a very important point I want to highlight. Never stretch the capsule hooks too much, especially in such cases. Because these anti-capsules in white cataracts, especially who have long-standing cataracts in elderly patients, they're very fragile. And if you try to pull them a little bit more, they can easily rip off. So be very kind and gentle to them and just enough to hold them. Your aim is to just enough to support it and you're not going to dilate or expand the capsule bag. So we need to be mindful of this uh, concept. So now the situation is we have a CTR inside the bag. We have got four capsular hooks supporting the bag. Now I think managing the nucleus should not be an issue. So time to manage the nucleus. The nucleus is not very hard. It's about say grade three plus and uh, I'm hoping that it shouldn't cause much of an issue for me. In this case, I'm going to create a small central pit so that I get a good hold of the nucleus before trying to do the vertical chopping. So I've sculpted about 50 to 60% depth central 3 mm I'm changing the settings to the longitudinal mode. The tip is buried into the substance of the nucleus. My right hand lifts up the nucleus just a little bit. The vertical chopper goes down and then laterally. So all these maneuvers have to be as gentle as possible.
Even when I'm trying to rotate the nucleus, I need to be as gentle as possible. Preferably use both the instruments, uh, gently rotate them and then keep on dividing it. So I usually I draw an imaginary line about say 4 mm from the center of the Hirschberg reflex and I want to ensure that the instruments in my hand don't go beyond this. It's like foul call if you go beyond this. So by this your maneuvers are extremely minimalistic and by this we ensure that we get the job done but using very minimal forces and using the appropriate technique. The only secret here is to be patient and to ensure that your second instrument is really placed deep down when you are doing the lateral separation maneuvers. So as a surgeon, if at all there is one skill which we need to be very mindful and focused on achieving is to be the gentleness, you know. So we are dealing with something extremely precious. This is probably the most precious thing which we have, the eyes of our patients. So practicing to be extremely gentle on them should be our motto. So many young surgeons who come for our training, I realize that their movements are a little bit more aggressive, they look a little bit harsh. I think you just have to focus on how your hands are moving inside the eye. Concentrate on it. I'm sure everyone can be as gentle as possible. So once you've broken down all the fragments into smaller pieces, now is the time to emulsify each of them in a controlled manner. These are the settings for the quadrantry mole and each of the fragment is pulled out of the bag and emulsified at the level of the rexus. So last fragment is aspirated out. There is some epinucleus and cortical material in the anterior chamber. I'm just going to burp it out using the viscoelastic. Time to disengage the capsular hooks because I would be placing the lens in the sulcus. So there's a reason. And there's a small moment of scare here. One of the capsule hooks has got stuck under the flange of the BX ring. Again, you need to be very patient and slowly but steadily I could disengage it from the BX ring and then pull it out. So, you know, things can go wrong at any stage of the surgery. So, some level of you know, concentration is required to deal with these surprises. Uh, slowly and steadily the cortex is being aspirated out. At this point, I can see there is a slight positive pressure. The posterior capsule is not exactly concave. It looks to be flat. And I am concerned that, you know, posterior capsule would be bulging up. There is a faint suspicion that there could be a vitreous fibril hanging around it. So before putting in the lens, I would want to confirm the absence of any vitreous. I use a diluted transient state. I couldn't detect any. Let me zoom in and pause for a moment here. We can see these multiple small dot-like uh, structures which are actually behind the posterior capsule in the burger space. Now these are a testament of the fact that these are the evidence that you know there has been fluid misdirection. These are nothing but debris of the lens which have found a way across the zonules into the burger space. So this is an indirect evidence that you know fluid has got access uh, to the burger space. So time to place the lens. Again, an important tip here is I would always prefer to use sodium hyaluronate to place in between the iris and the anterior capsule. This would help us to create and maintain that space in between the iris and the capsule. I don't want the haptic to go into the capsule bag. Because there's a positive pressure, the space is maintained well enough. Now, contrary to what HPMC would have done. The haptic opens out very gently and I'm certain that it is in the sulcus. The trailing haptic is now being dialed in. As the trailing haptic was dialed in, I thought there was any some fiber hanging around it. I wasn't sure whether it's a vitreous or a cortical fiber. All the notches of the BX device are disengaged and they're pulled out of the bag. This strand definitely looks like a transzonular a vitreous fibril. I just go in with my cutter. So again, I'd like to pause here and ask you what setting would you use in your vitrectomy machine. So in this case, I am consciously using the IA cut mode. In a sense, first irrigation, then I'm going to aspirate and then cut. This is the mode which I typically use when I'm dealing with only one fiber or a couple of fibers, not the entire vitreous jelly. So the idea is we can engage it and uh, cut it. It's just like a scissors. And we're going to engage and cut. But there's one important caveat. 
if you are going to aspirate first and if the vacuum or the flow rate is higher everything will be sucked in including your pupil and the iris they all are at risk of getting chewed away so the trick again here is to lower down your flow rate now this is a peristaltic pump this is a phaco machine and so you have to dial down the flow rate the flow rate is dialed down to maybe 12 the vacuum again by make it 250 or 300 by doing so we have got better control on how the vitrector behaves okay so even if i go very close to the iris i am unlikely to catch and hold the iris so that's the reason why i need to do this so again i always keep telling that a surgeon has to be one step ahead in anticipating always think what can go wrong so in my chase of the vitreous fibril i shouldn't end up chewing up the iris that is my secondary concern with this i have planned it out and what would be the cutting rate the cutting would be set at the highest but it's in linear fashion so the if i press more the cut rate would increase if i slow down the cut rate would decrease so that's the idea and this is my preferred way of working when i'm dealing with one single strand of vitreous so again it's going to take some time to ensure that the chamber is really free from vitreous okay so i uh, need to be very patient again remember the code forget the clock and look at the calendar Now again one more point when you're doing this anterior vitrectomy why not go from the the pass plan approach now in this case uh, there is no visible zonular dialysis the amount of vitreous prolapse is minuscule in this so i would be reluctant to use the pass plan approach for in this particular case i have dealt with the transzonular vitreous migration similarly to the limbal root quite successfully so i thought i could manage that so that's one point to take home I'm just irrigating with my irrigation cannula to remove some of the OVD which is probably got behind the lens. So I'm using diluted trypsinacetate to check for any remaining vitreous. Thankfully there is none. The pupil has come down in size a little bit. And now I have to achieve the optic capture that is I need to push the optic behind the lens. So I retract the pupil with my irrigating cannula and then push the lens back ensure that the optic has gone behind the uh, rexus margin. I confirm it again using a Y hook on both the ends the ovalization of the rexus confirms the optic is behind the capsule and we have achieved an optic capture so I like to use the word I will trap simply because we are trapping the bag in the eye well the haptics are in the sulcus and the optic is inside the bag it is like the haptics of the lens actually supporting the bag so that's the idea of using this term I will trap So I'm just going in with the vitrector to remove some of the OVD and also if deal with any coincidental presence of any vitreous fibril. Uh, at this stage we can clearly see this iridotomy which is nice and patent. So if the patient did not have an iridotomy in such a case I would have gone ahead and done an iridotomy uh, because these are the cases where you know sometimes there is always a risk of a, a malignant glaucoma like picture developing and the iridotomy would not help uh, the malignant glaucoma per se but it would at least help us to rule out pupillary block in such an event so at last the time has come to close the, all the wounds and uh, this is how the case looks at the end so actually the surgery took me about 60 minutes so what it was worth it these are the first day post op pictures the cornea there is some amount of mild edema pressure is around 20 she is doing fine and these are the post op oct pictures and she continues to do well so if you hung on until this stage of the surgery then uh, you would have learned uh, quite a lot of pearls and uh, so the bottom line message here is that preparation is the key to success in surgery for all the young surgeons i think you know examine your patients very closely anticipate all the things which can go wrong write it down and then you need to be mentally prepared and also have all the tools necessary to deal with such situations in such sort of cases you need to be mentally be ready with maybe plan a to plan e and have all the necessary tools ready at your fingertips you never know what you get in such cases so in this case I had written down everything but I was not uh, very explicitly mentioned that uh, there could be a possibility of a transzonular vitreous prolapse which did happen. So the message is be ready for everything and never take anything for granted. So that's it thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.